So thank you, Dr. Popejoy. And now we'll have uh, Dr. Wendy Roth. All right. Well, thank you so much for being with us today. Um, we're very sorry that we couldn't talk to many of you at South by Southwest, but are thrilled that you're here now. Um, and where I would like to pick up is really on that last point that Dr. Popejoy made. So when she talked about in her last slide how ancestry can change, most of that slide was talking about how do the results, what, the, what ancestry is reported in your results change over time. Um, but the very last bullet point there was about interpretation and how people's interpretations of those results can change. And that's where I take over because I'm a sociologist, so I'm not looking necessarily at the science behind these tests so much as I am looking at how people make sense of them. Um, talking to people who have taken tests and trying to understand how they um, interpret and come to terms with what they're learning. So, Many of you might have seen this Ancestry.com ad. Um, it shows a man by the name of Kyle Merker who tells us that growing up, he was German. He used to dance in a German dance group and wear lederhosen, but then he took a genetic ancestry test, which showed that, according to him, he wasn't German at all. What it said was that 52% of his ancestry came from Ireland, Wales, and Scotland. And as a result of this, he traded in his later hosen for a kilt. Well, a lot of people have the impression that genetic ancestry tests can tell you your race or ethnicity. And it's partly because of ads like this, which really encourage you to think that, that lead you to think that it can be very um, immediate and almost deterministic, like the um, ancestry results that you get determine and tell you who you are. Um, Genetic genealogy companies will often use language like this. They um, use language that suggests these tests can introduce you to you or tell you who you really are. And um, they imply, although they very rarely um, state it in these terms directly anymore, but they imply that this means that these tests can tell you what your race or ethnicity is. And in particular, this is the message that a lot of people take away from a particular type of text, test, the one that Dr. Popejoy was talking about uh, most recently, the admixture tests. So these results, this is just one of many kinds of genetic ancestry tests, but these tests are often presented as a percentage breakdown. And for instance, they might specify the proportion of ancestry that comes from Europe, Asia, Sub-Saharan Africa, and so on, with these large continental groupings, and sometimes subgroups within them. Um, you can see here in this slide, um, in the uh, top right corner, one of the earliest images from a company called Roots for Real that really shows a, a clear pie chart with these continental groups, and then some more recent um, test results from Family Tree DNA and 23andMe. And they have gotten a bit more detailed over time. But even the contemporary ones still tend to present these results in categories that really overlap with commonly used racial and ethnic labels. So maybe it's not that much of a surprise that people looking at this think that this is about race and ethnicity. Well, in a recent study, I analyzed a qualitative interviews with 100 American test consumers from different or racial and ethnic backgrounds. So these were people who had bought tests for themselves. And before taking a test, they said that they identified either fully or partly as white, black, Hispanic, Asian, or Native American. And um, I analyzed this with my co-author, Bjorn Ivemark. Um, I want to emphasize that most of the people that we spoke with did not change their identity based on the test results, but a significant group did. So a substantial portion, a little over a third of the people we spoke with, changed their identities, their ethnic or racial identities, based on the test results. And more specifically, what we found was that when people got their test results back from one of these direct-to-consumer companies, they tended to cherry pick their new identities. It wasn't that they looked at the test and they said, oh, this is who I am, but rather they would pick and choose certain ancestries that the tests reported, and they would adopt those, but they would ignore others that the tests were also telling them about. 
and which ancestries they identified with was based primarily on two considerations. So first, there was their preferences or attitudes towards that group. People tended to adopt new identities with groups that they admired, respected, or liked in some way. And they often rejected those that they disliked or had biases against. And second was their assessment of acceptance by others, whether other people would accept their claims to being a member of this group. This was um, typically about whether they felt that their appearance or their personality uh, matched their beliefs about how members of the group looked and behaved. And I'm going to give you some examples of how people reacted to these tests. And I'll just note that I've changed people's names here. So these are pseudonyms. But one example of this cherry picking is from a man that I call Eduardo. He is a Mexican American who initially identified as non Anglo white with Native American ancestry. And his tests reported Native American, Celtic, and Jewish ancestries. Well, he did not identify as Celtic, but he chose to identify as Jewish, and he explained why. He said, I always looked up to the Jewish people and Jewish friends and neighbors. I just feel better now because I'm one of them. So it's not like I thought of them as lower than me. I thought of them as higher than me. I just have reached now the top with them. So he had these early life experiences with very positive um, interactions and um, attitudes towards Jewish people, his friends, his neighbors, and those interactions made it seem desirable to him to want to be Jewish. But he also factored in what he thought other people would accept. And he later explained why he didn't identify as Celtic. So he went on to say, I can pass for a Jew, there's no question about it. There's no way I could pass for a Celtic because I'm dark and sort of fat, short. And because this ideal we have of the Celts, they're tall, strong, big people. I just went to see How to Train Your Dragon. It's about this Celtic group. It's a cartoon and all of them are like seven feet tall, massive arms, massive bodies. And I'm more like the little kid, he was puny. So it's just pff, stupid Mexican dreaming he's got Celtic blood in him. That's what he imagined people would say if he tried to claim that he was Celtic. Now, for some respondents, assessing whether other people would accept their new identity was based not on their appearance, but based on how well they felt that their personality fit the group. And this was often based on stereotypes about how the group behaves. An example of this is Walter. He is a retired telecommunications specialist who identified before testing as black, but he always perceived himself as mixed. And he was thrilled to find out that part of his ancestry was Jewish. He began wearing a yarmulke and a Star of David, and he was considering applying for Israeli citizenship. Now, Walter said that he had a lot of behaviors and interests that made him feel connected to Jewish people. He had always been interested in Middle Eastern history, for instance, and klezmer music. And he said, I also have been accused of acting like a Jew, even before I knew any of this other stuff from the genetic ancestry test. So I have some behavioral tics. I'm totally fascinated by numbers, patterns, and things like chess, mathematics, physics, economics. I'm sure there's a genetic component. Now, Walter was happy to find out about this Jewish ancestry. So he adopted it and it reinforced his belief that there's this genetic component to all these traits, right? And this is a view that is sometimes called racial essentialism or genetic essentialism. The belief that people's genes determine not just what race they are, but what they're like, what they're good at, what they're bad at, what their core essence is like. And this is a view that we know is very closely related to racism. Um, but what's interesting here is that, you know, Walter doesn't see that as a problem. He's, he just gets this reinforced view that there's this genetic component to his behavior because he's happy about this result. What's interesting is that people who aren't happy to discover a particular ancestry, they rarely believe 
that it too influences how they behave or what their core personality is like. Now, when the test reported ancestries that people had negative views of, they tended to reject them. An example of this is Carolyn, a 59-year-old retiree who initially identified as white, but had unconfirmed family stories of Native American heritage. So she took a test and she expected to find Native American ancestry, but instead her test reported some Saharan African ancestry. And she had trouble getting her head around that, and she just decided not to share it with her family. And she explained why. She said, well, I guess I'm prejudiced. And she laughs. Isn't that a terrible thing to say? It's not really that I'm so prejudiced. I don't have anything against African Americans. I don't understand them all the time, and I've heard things said about them that aren't very complimentary. I really feel they have been not treated fairly, and they may never be treated fairly in this country. So it's not something I want to bring myself to have all the problems that they have had to put up with. Now, Carolyn didn't think that she looked African American. Um, she didn't think that her appearance uh, belied that ancestry, but she still thought that people might treat her differently if she mentioned the test result. So she just disregarded this ancestry and she didn't change her identity at all. Similarly, when people have a very highly valued identity before they take a test and their results don't support it, they often chose not to believe the tests. An example of this is Shannon. She is a 57 year old artist and she had been adopted and thought of herself as white until age 18 when her adoptive father told her that she had Native American ancestry. She identified strongly with her Native roots after that, and she took an admixture test to confirm this ancestry, but it came back reporting that she had no Native American ancestry. And she declared, the first DNA test we did was to find out our ancestry, how much Indian and stuff. And when that came back, I about fell over because mine said zero for Native American. And I'm like, okay, either my dad isn't my dad or you know what is going on here? I mean, I was literally hysterical. That's how much it means to me to be Indian. Well, Shannon claimed that she didn't really understand how these tests work, um, but she decided that it simply must be wrong. And she continued to identify as white and Native American. And I think this shows something really important too, because there's been this idea that these tests are going to take over as indicating a person's identity. They're gonna look at the tests, they're gonna to defer to the science, and they're going to automatically say, this test tells me my race or ethnicity, this is who I am. But there's something else that can happen too. If people get test results they don't like, it can actually diminish their belief that the tests are providing scientific proof. And that's what happens with Shannon. Well, there are a lot of other examples from my research of test consumers who were picking and choosing which ancestry to accept or reject based on their preconceived attitudes and biases towards the group, and also based on whether they thought that other people would accept their identity claims. And this illustrates that genetic information doesn't offer objective or authoritative truth about race or ethnicity. Rather, people tend to accept the stories that they want to hear, and they tend to disregard the rest. And that really shows or, or emphasizes that the identities that people are choosing, they're not just influenced by their genes, they're not just determined by their genes, they're influenced by people's preferences, their desires, their psychology, and by the rest of society around them, how the rest of society sees them. So people really look at this information through a social lens and decide what to take away from it, rather than it being an automatic or deterministic process. If there's anyone out here today who is thinking about taking a genetic ancestry test, my recommendation is that you don't take these tests just to find out your race or ethnicity. These tests may be able to tell you useful things like um, who your second cousin is or who you might be distantly related to, but they can't tell you 
who you are or what your race or ethnicity is. Thank you.